Do you know what the best thing is about quitting my job and going full time? It's 12.30 on a Tuesday. And for the first time since becoming unemployed, welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. If you remember back a couple of weeks ago, I put together this $640 budget gaming PC. And at the time, I put an RX 580 inside, as I said it was the best bang for the buck graphics card that you could get for about the $200 price point. A couple of you down in the comments, though, were not all that happy that I went with a three and a half year old RX 580 and wanted to see some upgraded graphics card options, even though this system is built around a Ryzen 5 1600, which is also two and a half years old. But little did you know that I had already planned on doing a follow-up video, rounding up the best graphic card options for around the $200 price point. So let's get this show on the road. I think we'll start right here in the middle with the graphics card this all started with. That is the XFX RX 580 XXX 8GB edition that I originally put into this PC. The RX 580 is based off AMD's previous generation graphics architecture, Polaris, running the 14 nanometer FinFET. It features 2,304 stream processors running at a boost clock of 1366 MHz and 8GB of GDDR5 running at 8000 MHz. This particular RX 580, the XFX XXX edition, yeah, that's just as difficult to say as it sounds, features probably one of the more polarizing graphics card looks on the market with its carbon fiber and cutout shroud design. From all the comments I've seen online since its release, this really is a love it or hate it type aesthetic. I personally dig the look, and if you design a system around it, it can really complement a system. However, your mileage may vary depending on what parts you have in your particular build. Aesthetics aside, the XFX RX 580 has always been a great performing card and is still available brand new today for that $170 price point I mentioned earlier, which is about $100 off its original retail price. Hopping on over to Team Green's side of the fence, we have the Gigabyte GTX 1660OC. This card originally debuted in March of 2019, making it about 15 months old at this point, and is based off Nvidia's most recent Turing architecture. It features 1,408 CUDA cores running at 1830 MHz and 6 GB of GDDR6. And rounding us off back in Red's corner is the Asus ROG Strix RX 5500XT 8G Gaming. And no, I don't think that long name is compensating for anything, as the card is plenty big already. The 5500XT is based on Navi, AMD's most recent graphics architecture, and their 7 nanometer FinFET. It has 1408 stream processors running at 1865 MHz and 8GB of GDDR6. Wait, the 1660 has 1408 CUDA cores, and that has 1408 stream processors. I'm sure that was a coincidence. Both the Gigabyte 1660 OC and the ASUS ROG Strix 5500XT are running about $229 online, meaning between those two cards, it's going to come down purely to performance. But don't forget, the XFX RX 580 is still about $60 less than either of those two cards, so it might still make a pretty compelling option. And with all that out of the way, let's get into the benchmarks. Just in case you didn't see the video where I built this PC, here is a quick rundown. It's got a Ryzen 5 1600AF 6-core 6 12-threaded CPU and 16GB of DDR4 2666 memory. All of that is on an ASRock B450M HDV motherboard, and the total price to build with the XFX RX 580 was about $640. Upgrading to either of the other two graphics cards will bump that build price up to about $700, as again, they're about $60 more than the RX 580. And one last quick note before we get into the results. These are some of the most wildly varying results that I've ever had on the channel. And I also know they're accurate because I ran the entire slew of tests twice, on two different days, with graphics card driver uninstalls in between each graphics card swap. So I know they're accurate, but they're just weird. Let's get into it. Starting out with our synthetic tests in 3D Mark Firestrike, the winner here is actually the RX 580. Yeah, the plucky little three and a half year old graphics card actually beat out the other two. And in the case of the GTX 1660, it wasn't even a fair fight, winning by a full 3,000 points. The Navi-based 5500 XT kept it close at least with a score of 14,400, losing by only 600 points. But still, I was shocked to see the RX 580 hold up that well. Moving on to DirectX 12 and 3D Mark Time Spy. What do you say we take those previous results and just flip them on their head, shall we? Yeah, the GTX 1660 won with a graphics score of 5600, beating the 5500 XT by a full 800 points and the RX 580 by 1100 points. So again, not even a fair fight, but this time we're going the other direction. I wish I could say that my gaming results helped clarify things a little bit, but in fact, I think they just muddied the waters even more. Tell you what, let's start out with a game they all sucked at in Red Dead Redemption 2. 
at 1080p and the graphics quality preset slider sitting right down the middle, we see all three graphics cards score an average of about 60 FPS with 0.1% lows in the high 20s and low 30s. Now normally I would try to pick a winner even out of that based off of a low frame rate or an average frame rate, but in this case all three of them won one of those metrics, with the 5500 XT having the best average frame rate, the RX 580 scoring the best 1% low, and the 1660 scoring the best 0.1% low. Or I could look at the 1440p settings, and well, it's the exact same results down there, with the averages sitting right about 45 and the 0.1% low sitting in the high teens. And again, all of them winning one of those metrics. Another game where all three cards scored pretty much right down the middle was Doom Eternal running in Vulcan and Ultra settings. Well, they say Ultra, I say Medium, because Ultra happens to be the middle setting. In this game, all three cards managed about 120 FPS on average at 1080p and about 90 FPS at 1440p. However, there is enough of a difference that I can call the GTX 1660 the winner in this game, as it did score the best average, 1% low, and 0.1% low across both resolutions. So it's the winner, but not by much. Sticking with Bethesda, I also benchmarked the 2016 version of Doom in OpenGL. And before you yell at me, yes, that was on purpose, as I wanted an OpenGL test as part of my benchmark suite, not just to repeat the Vulcan results that I had in Doom Eternal. Here again, the GTX 1660 was the winner, but this time in a pretty dominant way, with 132 FPS average at 1080p and a 0.1% low of just 62. The RX 580 comes in second here with an average of 95, and the 5500 XT rounds us out with an average of 86. GTA 5 is a title that traditionally favors Nvidia cards, and here again that is the case, with the GTX 1660 scoring 110 FPS on average, with a 0.1% low of just 68. In fact, it leans so far Nvidia's way that the 5500 XT managed only 70 FPS on average, or about equivalent to the 0.1% low of the 1660. Moving up to 1440p shows an even more dramatic difference, with the 1660 doubling up the other two cards, scoring 100 FPS on average. Jumping into a couple racing titles with Project Cars 2, we see the 1660 again score a narrow victory, with 112 FPS on average at 1080p. However, the 5500 XT is right behind it at just 109 FPS on average. Now, a 3 FPS difference is not enough to declare one card a victor over the other. However, if you look at the 1% and 0.1% lows, the 1660 is clearly the better option here, managing 82 FPS on a 0.1% low versus just 38 on the 5500 XT. But remember back to the middle of this video when I said the benchmark results got confusing at some point? Here's where that starts. The 5500 XT picks up the minor victory at 1440p, including a 0.1% low that is a full 8 FPS faster than the 1660, and a full 30 FPS faster than it scored at 1080p. I ran these benchmarks 6 times each, that is 6 times at 1080p and 6 times at 1440. This is the average of those results. Wreckfest returns us to a little bit of normalcy, with the 1660 scoring 120 FPS on average and the 5500 XT scoring 96, and the results stair-step down from there, meaning we can declare the 1660 the winner of this test. Hitman 2 was also pretty interesting, with the 1660 winning straight up, but the RX 580 again scoring a second place win here by a full 10 FPS over the 5500 XT. The results are a little bit closer at 1440p, but none of these cards scored very well at the 0.1% low, with the 1660 managing only 15 FPS. And rounding us out is CSGO, with the RX 580 taking a very unexpected victory here at 243 FPS on average at 1080p and very high settings. The 5500 XT winds up in second place here yet again, trailing the RX 580 by about 10 FPS in every metric. Now this is not usually the way that I like to wrap up graphics card reviews, but seeing as how all three cards scored all three positions, depending on what tests that I ran, this was the only way that I could come up to get my mind around it. I gave three points to every first place finish, two points to a second place, and one point to every third place finish for all of the synthetic and gaming benchmarks. And the results are... The RX 580 and the 5500 XT scored 18 points, and the 1660 scored 24 points, making, I guess, the 1660 the winner? I guess? Now, to be fair, the 1660 did come in first place the most often, so that does kind of make sense. But it also had a couple of head scratchers in there, with CSGO losing by about 65 FPS and 3D Mark Firestrike not even being competitive. It ran away with a couple of victories in GTA 5 and Doom in OpenGL, but it also lost in Project Cars 2 at 1440p. I think the end story here is all of these cards are very competent 1080p ultra settings gamers. In fact, all of them average 60 FPS in every single game that I tested, except the 1660 couldn't manage it in Red Dead Redemption 2, and the RX 580 couldn't manage it in GTA 5. 
Even at 1440p, GTA 5 and Red Dead Redemption 2 were the only two games that the AMD cards couldn't average 60fps on. However, if we move away from straight-up performance, there might be a couple of features on these cards that might swing your opinion one way or the other. If you do any video editing or game streaming, I would tend to lean towards the GTX 1660. Not only did it win most of the gaming benchmarks, but the new NVENC chip that's on board is phenomenal for video encoding work. If you're more concerned with power draw and heat generation by your system, I would opt for the 5500 XT. Under full benchmark load, the system peaked at just 228 watts with that card installed, versus 250 watts with the GTX 1660, and wait for it, a full 109 watts more at 337 watts with the RX 580. If price is your main concern, go with the RX 580. Yes, it's three and a half years old, and yes, it draws almost 50% more power than the 5500 XT, but it proved that it's still a competent gamer in 2020 at 1080p, and with a couple of settings tweaks on GTA 5, you can run at 90 FPS. This was showing the worst case scenario at ultra settings with all of the sliders turned up to max. There's one last consideration that people often overlook when buying a graphics card, and that's physical space available in your case. Now, if you look at all three of these graphics cards from your angle, they all look about the same height. However, the Gigabyte is considerably shorter in at least two dimensions. Now, I already mentioned the RX 580 having a little bit extra junk in the trunk, but it pales in comparison to the ROG Strix, which is a two and a half slot thick card, meaning that if you plug it into the second PCI Express slot in a micro ATX case like my system right here, the power cable coming up from the bottom will likely rub on that rear fan. And in fact, I had to wrap my power cord around the back of the card just to get it to plug in and for that fan to be able to spin. So keep that in mind before making your selection. So there you have it. There's really not one of these graphics cards that I would lift up, put on a pedestal and say, this is the graphics card for your budget system in 2020. Although that'd make a much more clickable thumbnail. Pretty much my answer is it comes down to what are your individual needs and did you consider everything when you bought one of these? Do you want something that sips on power and is cool and quiet inside your system? I never once heard the fan spin up on the 5500 XT. Do you want to save 60 bucks right up front and you don't care how much heat it generates? RX 580 is still a great option here in 2020. Do you need NVENC and a little bit more compact card to run inside your box? Well, the 1660 has you covered. If you want to pick up any of these graphics cards, I will have Amazon affiliate links down in the video description below. And on your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing and think about joining the Patreon. A minimum donation of $1 per month gets you access to my exclusive Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. Thank you guys so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Nice of you to join us. Is my microphone that interesting? I was about to say, watch your step. You are so helpful. Ugh. Thanks, cat. Leave him alone. Hey, 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 hey. Would you stop it? At least look cute on the camera. Don't just mess my shit up. Yo, at least turn around. At least turn around if you're gonna be on the camera. Yeah, that's better. Where was I? <laughs> Brew for today is from Level Beer up in Portland, Oregon. This is the five pound hammer hazy IPA at 7.0%. This hazy IPA uses a ton of hops, giving it that juicy tropical and fruity flavor and aroma that all the hazy boys love. Boom. Wow, that is orange. Orange, 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 orange. Tastes like a very thick orange juice with a little bit of hop on top. This is what would happen if Simply Orange Orange Juice made a hazy IPA. It would taste exactly like this. I have to say, it is very refreshing, but even just a couple of drinks in, that acid is already building up in the back of my throat. And I've said this a number of times on the channel, I do appreciate a good hazy IPA, but I can't stand the majority of them for more than about four ounces at a time because they just become unpleasant to drink. And I think that's the direction this one is heading. I'll say, this wasn't a bad beer. Again, I'm not a huge fan of hazy IPAs, but I do enjoy trying them because occasionally there's one in there that I really do like. This one, the acid got to me very early, but I'm actually finding it still quite pleasant to drink later on. Um, so if you're not a huge fan of the acid, don't worry, this one does die down eventually. 
However, if you are not a fan of floaties in your beer, oh my god, there is a lot of yeast and lactose just hanging out at the bottom of this one. Uh, if you're someone who gets grossed out by things uh, floating around in your drink, this is not a beer for you. Me, I don't mind that too much. So if you are a fan of hazies, I think this one is worth trying. But if you're more of a Northwest IPA style, less of the New England and the hazy craze, uh, give this one a pass unless you know exactly what you're looking for. Unless what you're looking for is sediment, in which case there's plenty of it.